And over the last couple of weeks, we have uh, kind of talked about um, just the importance of the huddle as Christians. Uh, and when a team huddles together, we talked about the power of the huddle a few weeks ago. And uh, last week, we talked about the importance of the play call within the huddle. And now, on a Sunday where we're sending a Daniel and Daniel and Jordan uh, had a special prayer for sending them out to college, we're talking about breaking the huddle. So that's kind of the theme of the heartbeat of today's sermon, uh, breaking the huddle. Right now, we ask that Joel would go ahead and read the word. The scripture for this morning is coming from the book of First Peter, chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, and it's found on page... 858 in your pew box. Just uh, give me an amen when you're there. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Father God, that is your word. And now as we get ready to study that passage, I pray that you would give us courage to obey that word. Father, may your spirit be our teacher this morning. And we'll give you praise and honor and This past uh, Tuesday, my, my family and I made a crazy trip, a one-day trip to western Pennsylvania. We woke up early in the morning, and we drove four and a half hours just so that we could see Steelers training camp in the Trove, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and I know it sounds a little crazy, uh, but growing up in western Pennsylvania, it's been a long time since I've been there and told my boys about it and wanted to take them. So Tuesday we woke up and drove all the way there and had a great day, and uh, I think so anyway. And, and then we turned around and came right back that night, and we got here by about midnight that night. And so our, it was kind of fun to go for me, given the series that we're in. We're talking about uh, teamwork and unity and huddling and all that sort of thing. And, you know, I love watching practice, um, whether it's high school pra practice or, or a rec practice, um, but they're on Chuck Noel Field to see the best of the best practice was something amazing for me. Just to see the special teams and the defense and the offense and, and working together. I, I especially enjoyed watching the, the rookies who were kind of on the bubble. You know, they don't know if they're going to make the team or not, so they're they're flying around trying to make a play and get their coach's attention. And it's, it's really neat to see uh, these guys who are at the top of their game playing a sport that they love and trying to make the team. There's competition to, to the max. The thing that I especially caught my attention was the work that's in the huddle. A number of times the, the teams would, the special teams and the offensive teams would rotate around the field. There's three large football fields there. And we were sitting near one end zone and the offense and defense rotated right, right in front of us one time. And so the, the, the coach would come out and give the quarterback the, the play. He would say, uh, you, know, you, you can see him looking at a, a clipboard and saying, here's the play. The quarterback would go to the huddle. The guys would huddle up, would look at the play. Then they would yell, break. Everybody would clap their hands. And they'd go to the line of scrimmage. On and on this happens. Break. Go the line of scrimmage. And you can hear that clap echoing throughout sort of the little valley that we were in there. Well, one particular play didn't end so 
well, and I heard a coach call out a player, Hey, you! Run the play! Except he didn't just say run the play, he said run the, you know, blankety blank play. There was some colorful description of the word play. And I looked at my kids and they were snickering at that description. Run the play. There were some of these new guys in the huddle. There's a lot of pressure of running a play. They don't want to make a mistake. Some of it's probably fear driven. They want to make the team so bad that they don't want to make a mistake. But yet they're not thinking about the play that's just been called. They're thinking about something else. They're, and they end up messing up the play. But the more you run the play and experience the conflict in the play, the better you get at the play. The very next play, the same coach that had used that colorful description barked out to that same player. Now that's what I'm talking about. That's a football play. See the guy left the huddle, put it into practice, and accomplished what he had set out to do. In reality, that's the scariest part about being a Christian. It's not the huddling out. It's not the play call. It's running the play of, of leading here and living out your faith. It's running the play of of leading a small group or a Bible study or some safe environment and then living out your faith in the culture to which God has called you. Because there's safety in being in the huddle. There's safety in being with like-minded people. But the challenge of faith comes in the tension of living out our faith. As Bob alluded to earlier, as these seniors go out to college, we're sending them out into a culture that's dramatically different than the one that we experienced when we left to go to college. If you don't believe me, let me just briefly mention some of the stories that have been in the news recently. I'll just say a couple words. Planned Parenthood fundamentally changed the way we look at things. Supreme Court redefining marriage. Religious liberties being threatened. Grotesque violence on the news every single night. And we can go on and on and on with the culture in which we're living. How should a Christian live in this culture that seems to have adopted the theme of the Old Testament book of Judges where everyone did what was right in their own eyes? How can we expect to impact it for Christ? In the challenge of one Christian business owner, do we bake the cake or not? When it comes to living out our faith, Christianity usually takes one of two approaches. The first approach Christianity takes is give up. We isolate. And as we're isolating, we, we love verbal grenades at how bad everything is, and we escape. That's one approach. The other approach that will probably be the most pressure for us and for the seniors who are going into college is to give in, to assimilate, and become like the culture. That's the biggest pressure that there is. But if you think of both of those positions, giving up and giving in, isolating or assimilating, becoming like the culture, there's really no suffering in either one of those positions. One is disregarded by society as a bunch of wackos, and the other is embraced by society when people finally cave in to the pressures of culturally determined values. Each are the exact opposite of what Christ called us to do. The Word didn't become flesh so that we could abandon the culture or become like the culture. The Word became flesh so that we could engage and take Christ to the culture. 
In other words, Christ has called you and me to break the huddle and to give to others what we have been given. To break the huddle and give to others what we have been given. That's exactly what we see in the passage that Joel read for us. 1 Peter chapter 2. And it challenges us not to stay in the safety of that huddle, but to break it and impact the culture of Christ. If we step back just for a minute and look at our culture as, as bad as it is, it's tempting to think that our ability to impact our culture is going to be really difficult and it's, it's too much, it's too bad. If we think our culture is bad, Zoom out to understand the culture that Peter is writing to. The Roman culture who had grotesque violence, who did not believe in biblical marriage at all. It was common for people to have more than one wife. It was common for people to engage in all kinds of grotesque lifestyles. What we are experiencing in our culture today is nothing new. In fact, I would say that as Christians, we have not experienced what the first century Christians experienced. The heartbeat of the book of 1 Peter is Peter is trying to encourage believers who are considering going to the sideline. You see, they had embraced Christ. They had taken seriously the call to, to, to break the huddle and impact the culture. But they were experiencing all kind of persecution and suffering for their faith. A lot of times when we come to faith in Christ, some people even teach this. We think everything's going to be fine in our life, right? The income's going to be up. Sorrow's going to be gone. Pain's going to be gone. Just a really good sell. Remember my two positions earlier? The isolation or the assimilation? There's no suffering in that. In the reality of our lives, there is suffering and there is pain. In the midst of persecution of living out our faith, Christ is challenging us not to abandon the culture or to assimilate with the culture. And through the words of 1 Peter, we learn that we are to engage the culture. That's a tension. That's a tension that we, that we walk the tightrope of giving in or giving up. And Peter challenges his readers, he challenges us as well to stand strong in the faith, to break the huddle, and give to others what we have been given. The verses that Joel read earlier. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12 are some of my favorite verses in the scriptures. And it sounds a little familiar to the, the passage that I preached with my candidate on Sunday. The call for us to be the church out of Ephesians. They are to me like, like bookends to the whole impact of, of, of our challenge to make Christ known. You know, that is the win the game theme, make Christ known. Verses 4 through 8 of 1 Peter chapter 2 help set up the passage that Joel read. So I, I'd like to read that here briefly for us. Peter, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, is challenging the believers for thinking of leaving persecution to stand strong. And then he's challenging them to remember the faith that they have. And remember who they are. Listen to how he sets it up. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, a stone that is chosen and precious. Who's he talking about? Correct. Verse 5. You yourselves are like living stones. Get the teamwork analogy, the, the interconnection of the huddle, the teamwork of today today's building, but he's using it through stones of a building, stacking on one another. You yourselves are being built up. It's a present passive. We're not building ourselves up. We're in the process of 
being built up. But who's doing the work? Christ. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the one doing the work. We are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who don't believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And then verse 9 starts with the, the conjunction that I love. What's, a, what's the first word of verse 9? But. <laughs> it's a contrast, right? Those are those who didn't believe. They were put to shame because they didn't believe. They stumbled over Christ. But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. A chosen race. What an amazing word to be chosen. Not at random but in the sovereignty of God to be a, a chosen people. Through God's miraculous and mysterious grace and mercy, He chose you and me before the foundation of the world began. That alone should blow us away at who we are. See, the first thing that Christ challenges us to do in this passage if we are to break the huddle and give to others what we can give them, we have to know our status. You are a chosen race. What's more, you're a royal priesthood. It's a spiritual house that's being built up for us to do the work. No longer do we have to go through layers of barriers to get to God or to work for God. We can come directly to the throne of grace because of Christ. We are his priests, ordained by God to join him in his redemptive mission. You are a holy nation, he continues. Some traditions like the word holy earlier in, in chapter 1 of the same book. Peter says, be holy for I am holy. A lot of times we take that as sort of license to isolate and to look something different. Yes, we are called out to be different, but not to abandon the culture in which we're called to impact the Christ. Sometimes we see the disconnect of that. Christ calls us to, to come out of that lifestyle, but he then he tells us to go change it through the power of Jesus Christ, not to abandon it. A holy nation, you know what? No matter how hard you and I work, we cannot make ourselves whole. So when you see this aspect of, of holiness, it is not something that we are working really, really hard to do and we can get on our own. Who is building us up? Christ. He does the work. We are his own special possession. That's amazing. We are his own special possession. A lot of times when we hear this, we think of me first. We think of, when it says you are, we think of that in the singular. But he's really talking we before me. I'm coming back to the aspect of unity here as a body of Christ. You are being built up as a spiritual house. Spiritual stones stacked on one another to form this body of Christ that he's calling us to be, to form this team, this, this huddle that he's calling us to be. So before we can interpret this as me, we have to first interpret, interpret this as we, that God is challenging all of us as the body of Christ. This is who we are. But then as we break it down, this is definitely applies to the individual within the body. Why did I say that? 
I want you to see yourself as connected to the person sitting across the church. And on this side, to see yourself connected to the person sitting over here. If one stone is pulled out, the wall begins to shake a little bit and crumble. We need each other as living stones that Christ is building up. So let's do the hard work of unity. Let's stand in that wall and say, you know what? It's going to be an amazing spiritual house. First Congregational Church of Chester, New Jersey. Amen? Amen. The chosen race, the royal priest of a holy nation, his own special possession. Does that sound familiar at all? I want you to turn back with me to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. People of God have just been delivered out of Egypt. Exodus 19. Moses went up to talk to God. The Lord called to him, verse 3, out the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people, for the, all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And in verse 8, after Moses went to the people to tell them, the people responded, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. He flip back to 1 Peter chapter 2, and look at verse 9, it says, you are, not you shall be, in Exodus 19, it says, if you obey my voice, if you keep my covenant, you shall be conditioned, right? On, on what? Yeah. On their ability to obey the covenant and obey his commands. You shall be. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, you are. It's a declarative, unconditional statement describing who we already are in Christ. The question is, what changed? What made the difference? Christ did what we could not do. He became flesh. He lived a perfect life. He died in our place for our sin. He beat death and rose again. Christ did what we could not do. And he gives us what we do not deserve. That's our step. Know your status. And when we know our status, it gives us confidence then to fulfill our purpose. Look at the second half of verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Here's the purpose part. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and in to his marvelous light. What is my purpose? We are to give to others what we have been given. We are missionaries, emissaries, sent out to represent our king, or in the terminology we've been using the last couple of weeks, to represent our coach. As God sent a son into the world, so he sends us. To do what? To sit on the sidelines and say, wow, man, you should have run that play differently. To proclaim the excellencies, the royalties, to proclaim our status and what Christ has done for us, who called us out of darkness. We didn't pick ourselves out of the, the miry clay that we, were, that we were stuck in. Christ called us out of that darkness and brought us into his marvelous light. We can't keep quiet about that. If Christ did that for us, shouldn't we also do that for others? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 
14 and 17, Paul says that we should never be like a lot of people who are peddlers of God's Word. We somehow figure out a different way of, of doing ministry and go against, I think, the heartbeat of Christ. But we as a people of God are commissioned by God. We should speak for Christ and spread His fragrance everywhere we go. Know your status and fulfill your purpose. Now there's such an amazing passage on who we are in Christ. There may be a tendency to think that it's all about us. Look at verse 10. Once you were not people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter is taking language from the prophet Hosea to remind us to stay rooted in grace. For some amazing, overwhelming reason, Christ chose us. Not because of who we are, not because of how pretty we looked, not because of anything we've done. He chose us. So as you get ready to break the hope, every day of the week, stay rooted in grace, the grace that has called you. And give to other people the same grace that God has given you. Finally, when we break the hope, our aim should be to make your king proud. Make your king proud. If you want to put it in there, make your coach proud. And when the coach comes out and follows the play, there's nothing better than to see that that play has been executed properly. Verse 12 says that we need to keep our conduct honorable among the culture to which we're called. Keep our conduct honorable. Does it make our king proud? Look at verse 11. Does it make our king proud if we give in to the passions of the flesh? If we give in to those things that wage war against our soul? No. It doesn't make him proud. So here we come back to the tension again, right? Another tension. Walking in the flesh versus walking in the spirit. And as we go out, there's sometimes there's a feel of fear of, the, of family when we do that. But he goes and says, simply, keep your conduct honorable. It's an amazing word here, right after the word conduct, at least in my translation. It says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles, honorable. If you're going to keep your conduct honorable among them, you have to be with them. Right? So we can't, we can't run to the isolation argument. It's not going to work. Our biggest tension, our biggest temptation is going to be not to get into the assimilation argument where we become like the culture. We have to engage the culture and take Christ to the culture to make our king proud. Verses 11 and 12 just really remind us that we are citizens of another kingdom. As we keep our conduct honorable, we live in such a way that makes our king proud. Break it down to something very, very simple. That means that we, we go to a restaurant today, we tip properly. I talked to a waitress in Texas who said that she hates working on Sundays because Christians are the worst tippers. It's so horrific right to me. We should be the best tippers. Maybe we should ask to pray for them as we pray for our food as well. We don't know what's going on in their life. We could go on and on with the application here. Keep your conduct honorable. Daniel and Daniel and Jordan, as you go to college, that's going to be a temptation. But I'll pray for you about that. I pray that God will protect you. And keep your conduct on. But it means we also apologize when we blow it. Three or four years ago, um, dropped my kids off at school. My oldest son was in middle school, I think in sixth or seventh grade. And I went to uh, went to a conference for pastors, and it was on how to be a better pastor. I got a call at the conference from the school that they had taken my son out of class and put him in the library because I didn't 
have the proper paperwork submitted into the office. No fault of my son, but he's taken out of the classroom, kind of embarrassed from all the kids, and taken to the library. And I thought, that's crazy. You're, you're hurting his education. Should he sit in class? You're giving him free do what you want period in the library. He said, we can't take him back to class until you submit the paperwork. And I said, I, I'm 25 miles away. I'm at a conference, and I really can't get there right now. Can you just do that? I'll bring it to the day. No, sir. I'm sorry. I can't. All right. Remember I talked about the living in the tension? <laughs> I gave it to her on the phone. I didn't swear, but I surely didn't keep my phone at home. I said, who do you think you are? You have no discretion at all. I, I was wrong. He goes, would you like to talk to the principal? I said, sure. I knew him. I played basketball with him. Got him on the phone, she put him on the speakerphone. She's there too. He said, what's going on? How can I help you? I said, hey, here's the situation. He goes, I already know about it.
What should our answer be? Who, who wears the robe? We all do. We all wear the robe. We are grace-filled storytellers, proclaiming the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. I want to show you an illustration. But it's going to take a couple minutes, and so I'm going to then come back and finish the sermon. But I, I need some help. I'm going to call some people out. Um, I'm looking at Rich. Rich, can you come up front? Okay, just stand down here. And uh, Joe, I'm going to pick on you. Come over here. And then uh, who else can I pick on? Beth Condon, can you come over here? Uh, Kyle, I see you writing something down over there. Come here, you're taking studious notes, I'm sure. Come over here. Um, who else can I pick on? Um, where's, is there, hey, Thomas, come over here. Come on, Thomas. So what does this illustration of a huddle look like, right? I need, hey, Kip, come on, please. Come on, I need one more lady. Gail, come on. <laughs> All right. So this is our huddle, right? All right, so let's stand up here. And let's huddle together. Now, this is an open huddle. This is not going to work. We need to, come on, close this huddle. All right. So this is the huddle. We look in, right? Christ has given us a play. We say, great, we clap our hands, right? By the way, most of the time, we then go back and sit down. Right? Or we go to the sideline. Or we stay right here, stay in this huddle. We stay right here. See, we're the Christians. You guys are the non-Christians out there. Sorry, but today you're not Christians. <laughs> you're the non-Christians. We stay in this huddle. We say, God, please help us impact our world. God, please help us in our culture. Oh God, please help us in our culture. And we say in our book. According to the passage today, we've been called to what? Break the huddle. So let's do it again. Alright, call the play. Break. Alright, go, go to your seats. Don't sit down. Just stand up. See, the huddle was the Sunday morning, right? I need somebody back in that corner to stand up. <laughs> Tell me much to stand up. This is going to help my illustration a little bit, alright? Those who are standing, this is the huddle that has then broken the huddle, right? You break the huddle, then you go out to the culture, and where you are in your culture, in your sphere of influence, you proclaim the excellencies of God who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Six days a week. That make sense? And then you come back on Sunday morning, boy, we huddle up again, right? And then we leave again. And we come back, and eventually, what are you bringing back with you? You're bringing stories of God doing amazing things, not through just through you, but God used you in your brokenness to impact the culture for Christ. That's what it means to stay in the huddle, to get the game plan, and then break the huddle and impact the culture. Thank you. Give me a hand.
God who calls to do. Yours will be different than mine. Yet, our mission is the same. To impact the culture of Christ. I know we're talking about the tension of the huddle and walking to the line of the scrimmage to run the play. And sometimes you get it wrong and you get yelled at. And I hope the player that he yelled at that day really makes the team because I think he'll, he'll do good. Some of those guys that are on the ball really want it more than others. But sometimes when you get yelled at, you just want to go sit down on the sideline. And maybe you're there today. I was there Wednesday night. I took my two younger kids to football practice. And it was one of those days where Really, one of those afternoons where I just wanted to just kind of be by myself. I wanted to chill. So I pulled out my little folding chair and popped down to watch the practice. I'm stewing over a couple things in my mind and thinking about this week, thinking about ministry or whatever. I just wanted to be by myself.
and the mercy that all of us who were not your people have now become your people because of Christ. We've been grafted in. It's an amazing truth. Help us to not get arrogant in that, but help us to get confident, the grace-filled confidence that then we can impact the culture of Christ. Father God, thank you so much for sending Jesus to die on the cross. To do what we could not do. To rise again and prove powerful over the grave. Like the song we sang earlier, my chains are gone. We've been set free. We've been set free to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. God, as we take a step out of that door today, I pray that you give us courage to not isolate, to not become like the culture, but to engage the culture and take Christ to the culture. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone say it. Amen. Amen.